Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the mixtape. I'm Jason Emmett. I'm Casey Masterpiece. And I'm Twisted Kid Matt, whatever the hell I'm that was, Jay. I'm glad you did it, too. Uh, <laughs> and that's it for this week. We got rid of Stewie. We killed him again. Yep. He just keeps coming up like a bad nickel. Is it like nickel? Herpes. Or I don't know. <laughs> Do you know the flare up. that the Canadians got rid of their penny back in 2013 or some shit? Sorry, it was a weird tangent, but I said like a bad penny. The more and, you uh, know. We should get rid of ours. All right, so this week on the mixtape, we are going to be talking about sad songs that you might not know are sad when you hear them. And I think a lot of the songs on this list, we're, we're all going to agree that like one day it just sort of, like, wait a minute, what am I saying? Yeah, just kind of click. <laughs> like, it just clicks. Hang on a minute. Yeah. Um, as it goes, when I put the list together, there's actually one or two on this list that I was like, oh, I actually still to this day didn't know that's what that was really about. So um, some of them you guys are going to know. You're going to be like, I knew that. I've fucking heard that for years. And some of you guys are going to be like, you know, oh, crazy. But it's what we do here. We talk about music and movies and shit. If you guys haven't been going over and checking out the YouTube channel, we do one now. And uh, we're starting to get some views on them, which is really cool. Um, mm -hmm. And we're starting to work out all the bugs. So they're they're looking good and they're doing well. Sounding good. One mm -hmm. of the cool things Man, about good. that, why I'm kind of steering you guys there right now, is because um, we do interviews here on the show. We've got a couple that are going up. And we have been doing those as videos as well. So some of them just sort of work better as video. We'll keep doing the audio, though, for those of you. Because I know some people just... It's not e exactly easy to watch videos all the time. So while you're driving, <laughs> I mean, I do it. You just shouldn't. No, I do not do it. I'm just. Kidding. Uh, with that being said, uh, let's go ahead and kick this one off. Let's talk about some music here. Uh, I'm gonna right. I'm gonna start off with one that's probably become one that people talk about the most. Right, this one gets brought up all the time when people talk about songs that you were singing and thought were happy, and then one day it just sort of hit you. You want to take a guess at what it is, Kev? Hey, yeah. Uh... Hey, ya 2003 outcast. Um, I don't want to freak you guys out though. Uh, but I don't know if you heard what I just said. Hey, ya 2003 over 20 oh, years God. old. Yeah. I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> hey, ya is over 20 <laughs> years old. <laughs> now we have to explain to children what a Polaroid picture is and why you shake it. Right. <laughs> So for some of you out there, this is the first time you're being slapped upside the head with that how fast time goes by thing. Like no just, kidding. You're, you're mad at me now because I just pointed out that you're like, oh, my God. For me, the first time I remember I was listening to a, a local classic rock station here in town and they started playing Pour Some Sugar on Me. I went, that's not classic rock. That song's only. And then I just went, oh, God. Oh God. Right. <laughs> that was years ago, by the way. That wasn't recent. Yeah. And thanks, so Bowling for Soup. Well. Now you made it prophetic. <laughs> when did Motley Crue become classic rock? <sighs> oh, man. So for some of you out there, you're very angry at me right now. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, hey, y'all, this song is very upbeat. A lot of fun, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you're hearing it and everybody's dancing to it. And even the video is a ton of fun, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so much fun. Um, so in an interview with VH1, Andre 3000 said the song was about the state of relationships today. The song is about people who force themselves to stay in relationships even when they aren't happy. And then you start listening to the lyrics, right? And you're like, oh, my God. Uh, here, I'm going to read uh, of most of these songs. I'm going to read like a little snippet of some of the lyrics. Not all of them, but most of them. Actually, I think maybe all of them. But uh, you think you got it. Oh, you think you got it, but got it, just don't get it when there's nothing at all. So that right there is referring to the fact that you think you've got something, but what if there's no substance to your relationship at all? You're just staying together, right? We get together. Oh, we get together. But separate's always better when there's feelings involved. <laughs> if what they say is nothing is forever, then what makes what makes love the exception? So why you, why you, I'm not going to read them all. I'm I'm why? hearing this in Andre 3000's voice, right. by the way. And it's just weird looking at you <laughs> yeah. while you say it. Why, mm -hmm. oh, are we so in denial when you know we're not happy here? So it's basically saying. I believe followed by. 
if nothing if nothing is forever, <laughs> then what makes love the exception to that? You think love is forever? It's not forever either. Why are we staying in this relationship when we're just not happy here? It's basically singing. Like, it starts off singing about, thank God to mom and dad for sticking food. Like, don't know basically, how. why are people staying in relationships when they're the, fucking miserable? I never caught that part. For some reason, yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah. That's yeah. what the whole song is about. It's it's a sarcastic way of looking at it. But why, when you're miserable in a relationship, do you stay with it? Why do you force yourself to stay in a relationship when you know it's no good? When you know no one's happy? When you know it's not going anywhere? That's what Hey Ya is about. And it's still a fun song. Yeah. <laughs> but it's really not. Mm -hmm. It can make you a little sad. <laughs> now, when but you hear I feel it, like Outcast did that intentionally. They're like, we're going to take this super, like, absolutely. depressing concept and add just the happiest, you know, song with the do, 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 and the hand claps and shaking it like a Polaroid hey, picture. Uh, right. The brilliant group. Shake, shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it. Oh, like oh. Roy picture. What a great line, by the way. Now I'll be Yonsei's and Lucy Lou's. <laughs> <laughs> it's an amazing floor. song. Amazing, amazing song. Outcast is an amazing artist. You know mm -hmm. what? Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's. It, I remember hearing the song and thinking, this is so catchy and upbeat. And I actually thought it was the opposite for a long time. I thought the song was him talking about thank you mom and dad for staying because you've made me the person I am today. And we've got all these. Good... And then I started listening and I'm like, that's not what he's saying. Like, oh no. my God. You stayed together and made me a depressed, anxious person. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> God, now I think everybody's fighting around me at all times. Yeah. So yeah, there you go. That's what, Hey, y'all is really about. Sorry if we ruined anything for you. We got a couple more to do that today. <laughs> Cause we're about to talk about a song from 1973 from one Mr. Elton John. This would be Crocodile Rock. Uh, you might know that this song is, I mean, overall, it's kind of a happy song, right? It's, it's got that 50s throwback sound mm -hmm. to it, right? It's that real doo-woppy kind of thing. Uh, we get to hear the narrating, the narrating belting out narrator. I'll get the word right eventually. The narrator belting out how fun life it used to be when he would run around with this girl named Susie together and they would go out dancing all the time and they they would do a dance called the Crocodile Rock. These are literally the lyrics of the song. You know, I remember when Rock was young, me and Susie had so much fun. What you find out by the end of the song, though, is he's lamenting about the past because he's really miserable now because uh, he clearly tells us that Susie took off on him. She left him for some foreign guy. His words, I, I always picture this like sexy French guy with a sexy French accent. And, you know, and she ran, <laughs> Susie ran and went and left us for some foreign guy. Long nights crying by the record machine, dreaming of my Chevy and my old blue jeans. So this song is this guy lamenting about how the past used to be awesome. And now he's just a miserable schlub, like crying every night because this girl that he's obsessed over and these times that he obsesses over are like, eating him up and i think this song kind of speaks a lot of nostalgia mm. and i don't know as you guys get older do you guys find yourself suffering from like god i remember like the 90s when i was in high school or whatever and like things that you actually miss or remember and you look at the state of the world now and you're like i just wish it i felt like i did back then i don't necessarily sure. mean I want the world to be like it was. I want to feel like, uh, like before like, social media existed. Mm -hmm. well, well, before you knew yeah. enough that Good times. Shit, that shit bothered you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As you get older, so much shit bothers you. All right. And it's like, I want to go back to when like my life was getting to hang out with my friends after work and movies were fun enough. And we would just fucking go to the mall and eat in the food court and catch a movie. And it was just really fun. I wasn't caught up with all the bullshit that's that's around. Right. Me all the time. And so to me, I find myself every once in a while, like while I'm sitting at the, at the office or something, thinking about shit and going, why can't it? Why, like, literally, why can't it be like that now? I mean, I still have to work and pay bills, but I did that then, <laughs> you know? So why can't it be like that now? And I think that's what the song's kind of doing. He's lamenting. He's going, why can't it be like it used to be? Mm. He's getting kind of caught up in it. So there you go. Crocodile Rock. Which I think we talked about on an episode of uh, when like people steal music. Yes. 
and I, whether I or not because he he got he got in trouble for that. Well, they kind of came at him, but we kind of agreed. I think we all agreed that it's similar, but it's also very similar to a lot of songs from that era that he yeah. was sort of mm-hmm. making fun of. We're well, not making fun of, but and whatever. I'll admit I have never paid attention to the lyrics of the song. Yeah, like it's it just one that just. The, you know, I remember when Rock was young, when me and Susie had so much fun. Which and then one? after that, it's just gibberish to me. What is it? And just like, I don't know what he's been by, been holding rock, hand and skipping stones. The rock belt died. The rock something died. Susie went and left us for some foreign guy. Long nights crying by the record machine. Dreaming of my Chevy and my old blue jeans. Yeah. Never yep. paid attention to it. Yep. Because <laughs> Susie just fucking ran off, man. <laughs> With some sexy French guy. Yeah, Nord, Nord, Nord. Nordu shows up and can't you tell by my ridiculous accent? Oh, <laughs> fault in your general direction. I wave my private parts at your aunties. <laughs> you're, well, you're welcome, everybody. Um, so we're gonna go to the next song. We're we're gonna stay in the '70s for a minute. We're gonna go to uh, the year of my birth, 1976. Very famous, very famous theatrical. Uh, band from the 70s and 80s. Kev, you want to guess who this band is? Very famous theatrical. I'm going to guess Queen? No. No. More theatrical. More theatrical than that. They like to put on a show, that's for sure. Kiss? You kiss, yep. We're going to talk about Detroit Rock City by Kiss. I never knew that this was a depressing song. Did you guys? I had no clue. It's another one I didn't pay attention it's, sounds just like a song about a guy going yeah cars and chicks man well, then they then mm-hmm. they made the movie yeah. detroit rock city about the kids trying to get to the kiss concert which was a decent movie you know so this is off their destroyer album uh very again very very fast paced upbeat very rock song right um all that's on the surface though uh because the bummer of the whole thing is you know well let's be honest the song is all those things till the end so the whole song is kind of upbeat and fun till the end. At the end of the song, we find out he's okay. Let me let me break this down. He's been telling the story in the song of a fan, right? A, a fan that is excited to go to a Kiss, Kiss concert. But when we get to the end of the song, what we find out is the fan gets killed in a car accident on his way to the concert. Yeah, that's what the song is actually about. A dude that's excited to go to a concert, you, do the whole thing. You just kind of broke my brain a little bit because <laughs> I know of a cover song, which I'll bring up in a little while because I know of another band on this list. They're, they added car crash sound effects in the background of the cover version. Really? Yeah. It's kind Makes of fucked sense. up now that I think about it. Okay, cool. Carry so, on. Paul Stanley wrote this, right? And I, I'm, I want to tell you, this is based on actual events. So what Paul, Paul Stanley, and how he felt after he heard about it, and what he said about it was there had been an accident outside of an arena in Charlotte, so it's not Detroit, but he switched it out for Detroit because it worked in the song. He said, mm-hmm. someone was killed coming to the concert. I thought, how odd and how striking, and the juxtaposition of someone coming to a KISS concert, which celebrates being alive, only to lose your life. That was the twist of Detroit Rock City. To change it from a song about your amazing city to something much more epic. So a kid was, was I, I don't know if they got in a car wreck or what outside one of the concert venues, but it hit Paul Stanley when he heard about it. That it was like, that's just so wild to think of. And, and I can think of personal stuff I won't talk about here on the show, but where it's very similar. Where in his eyes it's like we're going to do something that should be fun or exciting, and you've you're probably build up to it, and then that's that's the last night of your life. You don't even get to see it. You're on your way to it, and it's just over. And I'm like, man, that makes it so so depressing. And the last line, like one of the last lines, is talking about him seeing the headlights of a truck coming at him, and he knows he's gonna die. That's like one of the last songs. Detroit Rock City is a very upbeat song, you know. Get up, get out. Detroit rocks. You know, it's it's very yeah, you know, yeah. So now it's going to be depressing anytime I hear Detroit rocks. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to actually listen to that later on. And to tell you what, we haven't done this in a while. Uh, I think I might have to make a, a playlist for this one for this episode. Yeah, yeah, we haven't done one in a while. So I will say this for for the video side of things, you probably will not hear music. Um, and for the audio side, there I will probably be in the background. 
uh, moving forward. But we don't put it on the video because, well, they'll take that shit down <laughs> really mm-hmm. fast. So we don't real do fast. So like if you're before you can video, post it, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, sometimes I feel like they knew. Yeah, you know, they're trying to get it up there. All right, so we're going to leave the 70s now, and we're going to move into the 90s. For the next two songs, we're actually in the same year. We are moving to 1997, and the first song we're going to be talking about is by a band called Third Eye Blind. And if you don't know already, that song is Semi-Charmed Life. And if you don't know already, this song is not a happy song either, <laughs> although it sounds like it. Uh, I think Anytime most time you put do 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 it's going to sound happy <laughs> and there are lines in it that sound that way like oh he's singing about something happy but you got to start listening to the lines underneath those lines mm-hmm. it's very crazy i think most of us can recall that that love this song can recall the day that it smacked us in the face what they were actually singing about like this is one of those you're sitting there like do 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 wait a minute what did he do wait a minute what? <laughs> What did he just say? Did he just say doing crystal meth will lift you up until you break? Yeah, absolutely. Did. Oh my god. <laughs> he also said yeah. face down on the mattress. Um, <laughs> so some of it's fun. <laughs> Were they alive at the time? Uh yeah. I haven't paid attention geez. to this song oh, too much you're either. It way worse. So Matt's right. This song is about a drug user who is slipping further and further into meth addiction. Mm-hmm. Uh Frontman Stephen Jenkins said, when I wrote Semi Charm Life, the guitar riff was intended to have this shiny thing because that was a feeling of speed. It's sort of a bright, shiny drug. And we all were sort of into hip hop. And so it was a hip hop flow over it. He said the song is about falling apart and the drug induced high that makes everything fleetingly feel better. The sky was gold. It was rose. I was taking sips of it through my nose some of the lyrics and i I wish i could get back there someplace back there smiling in the pictures you would take doing crystal meth will lift you up until you break it won't stop i won't come down i keep stock with the tiktok rhythm a bump for the drop and then i bump up i took the hit and i was given then i bump again then i bump again in case you guys don't know a bump is literally when you take a hit of something Mm. um like cocaine if you take a bump yeah take a snort yeah so this song is absolutely about addiction to crystal meth. Yeah. And how it, it makes you feel good, but it's all bullshit and it's fleeting. But how that's why when he says, I wish I could get back there someplace back there. Like, I think it's kind of like chasing the dragon, right? Mm. Um, this is a term I think most people have heard. I wonder if, mo- if people know what that term means, though. Like chasing the dragon basically refers to the first time, like I've heard, that I've never done cocaine. Matt, is it is it good? <laughs> like, do you know. like it? Do you like the way it smells? What the hell up? Never... <laughs> That's like Matt. You can't just shake. I'm your the head most up. boring person. <laughs> He's ever. never. I've never even smoked think, a cigarette. I don't think any of us all right here have yeah. ever tried any cocaine. Okay. I drank, yeah. but that's about it. Now I'm just hooked on coffee. Um. So the thing about it, from what I hear, from what I gather, is the first time you do cocaine, it's supposed to be mind blowing. Like, oh, my God, it's like the best feeling ever. But from what I've heard after that is you spend every time after that trying to hit that first time, but it slowly gets less and less. But you're chasing the dragon. You're hoping that eventually it'll feel like that again. It never does. I assume meth is probably the same way. I've never mm-hmm. tried crystal meth either. <laughs> but it's really crazy to think that semi-term life is about meth addiction. It's just fucking mind-blowing stuff. <laughs> yeah. This is our biggest hit, too. Yeah, by far. And they, it's a great song. And they took the hit that they were given. <laughs> and then they bumped again. And they bumped again. Uh, I was listening to this song yesterday. It's on a couple of my playlists. It's like, catchy as hell. It's a great song. I'm pretty um, sure it's on a past playlist we've done. I'll be honest, a couple of the songs we're going to talk about, though, it's like once I knew what they were about there. This one isn't hard for me to listen to, I, even knowing that. But yeah, like still Detroit Rock song. City and one we're going to get to here towards the end. It makes them kind of creepy. <laughs> like this is like I don't know if I want to listen to this anymore, but I still do, so it's all good. Uh, I have a feeling this next band is somebody Matt was probably really into. Maybe Absolutely, he knows who it is. Where we are now talking about the 1997 song, "The Impression That I Get" by the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones, and they finally get brought up on this show. 
Yeah, I know Matt was a, a big fan of ska in general, and this. Can band. you tell? Could you tell that I was a ska kid in the nineties? <laughs> I've um, definitely picked it up and hupped hupped a few times in my life, and have skanked in some pits on occasion. It up, up, up. <laughs> I love it so much. <laughs> skanked in some pits. some pits. I mean, this sounds way worse than it is. Like that sounds disgusting. I've hupped yeah. hupped and skanked in some pits. In some pits. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but it's all well. It's not. I mean, it's all harmless. It's all harmless. Well, no, I mean, yeah. not always. But <laughs> well, it should be. Yeah. It's supposed to be. You're not really yeah, supposed, supposed to be. But uh, mighty mighty boss tones. This was probably their only like hit as far as it goes. I mean, the band had some it's great probably their stuff, biggest. Yeah, but this was probably the well, probably the one that hit radio. Yeah, yeah. It's a great song. The impression that I get. Um, I actually didn't know. I, it makes sense when I go back and listen to it now, and it, I don't. I wouldn't say this makes the song overly depressing or anything. So it's not really still that sad. It's just sort of his opinion on some things. A lot of people believe that the true meaning of the song is about is regarding HIV, and more importantly, a man who finds out his friend has HIV, and he himself is too scared to be tested for it. Oh. Mm. Um, never looked at it that way, but all right. Can't yeah. say that definitively if that's true or not, but I can say that vocalist uh, Dickie Bar- Barrett has gone on record to say that the song was more about being tested in life in general. That's yeah, he, that's kind of what I thought it was. Yeah, he said it's basically how he has seen so many people around him get get hit with bullshit. Yeah, and he himself has never had to deal with that bullshit. Yeah. And he doesn't really know if he could handle it or not, but he thinks he can. Yeah. In other words, I'm not a coward. I've just never been tested. But if I did, a, if I did, I think I would pass. If I did, I think yeah. if, if I'd like to think that if I did, I would pass. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Um, now I so, can see why that could possibly apply to HIV testing. Well, yeah. here's some of the lyrics. Have you ever yeah. been close to tragedy or been close to folks who have? Have you it's ever felt the pain so powerful? Yeah. So heavy you collapse. No. Well, I'm, and you know, well, I'm not a coward. I've just never been tested. I'd like to think that if I was, I would pass. Look at the test, and I, th- I think there, but for the grace go, uh, I might be a coward. I'm afraid of what I might fight out. So that's why people are like, is he afraid? Hmm. Like, is he talking about a friend that he found out came down with HIV? And then you remember, this is the 90s. Um, and so now he's afraid. And he's he thinks he would pass, or is he just talking about life? Um, I yeah. always thought he was just talking about life. But I mean, like looking at a physical test, it's kind of brought up in the song as well. Like that's true. Looking at the test, that's true. So we don't. Damn. Know. All right, everybody. Yeah. Uh, playlist will be in the in the description. <laughs> Go ahead and check that out. I need to actually add all the things down in the description that I keep talking about. I just realized <laughs> none of the links I've mentioned in the past. Oh, in the description now you know there. what it feels like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you have to do show notes for the video and it's not that much fun. Is it? I know he's always picked right. on me and he'll, he'll just go jail, put that in the show notes. I'm like, you dick. <laughs> <laughs> now I do the show notes on the, on the videos. Yeah. So I don't know. I I wouldn't say that uh, the impression that I get is is a sad song, but it definitely has meaning that is a little not that doesn't go and coincide with the music. We'll say, like it just sounds like a fun, upbeat, happy mm-hmm. song. But you know, I've never yeah. had to knock on, knock on wood. wood. And before we move on to the next song, I wanted to say, mighty mighty Boston's. The band we're currently talking about covered Detroit Rock City by Kiss and added car crash sounds in the in the song towards the end. That's it, it actually opens. It actually opens with Gene Simmons talking about how he doesn't like that the Mighty Mighty Boston's are going to be covering Detroit Rock City. God. They included his voicemail in it too. Uh, you can hear all of this on the Kiss My Ass Kiss tribute album that came out, Fantastic. Uh, which also has previous um, guests of the show. Um, Toad the Wet Sprocket doing mm, coming, rock and roll all night. Concert if you're in the Cincinnati area, uh, they're coming to concert with the Gin Blossoms. So, who might so, also be on that that tribute album? Yeah. It's so. it's just first of all, of course, Gene Simmons said that. No, um, yeah. Second, I love that they added that <laughs> because if you've never heard it, it's 
it's pretty oh, I will I will check out their version of Detroit Rock City absolutely yeah. and now it's kind of weird that you're like oh god now I know why they added that like you've been listening to it for years mm-hmm. and never knew that I never knew I just that like I said that. it's to me it's always been a song about like cars and girls and stuff and yeah it's about a car accident at least the end is yeah yeah wow interesting and it's cool that it's cool that then we bring up the mighty mighty boss tones i didn't know that those two things were going to connect that's really neither cool. did i <laughs> so we have a few more to talk about um but the first next one, a word from our sponsor oh yeah let's yeah, do that let's that. insert a real quick word from our sponsors in right here head over to bustedtees.com find all your geeky apparel t-shirts hats stickers socks whatever with cool game and movie and TV-inspired stuff on it. I promise you're going to like this stuff. And at checkout, if you use my code, Jason25945, you're going to get 20% off. That's bustedtees.com, promotional code, Jason25945. All right, so we are back. (laughs) I'm not used to that. We're back. back from break. Uh, and we're going to move into the next song. And for this next song, we are moving up again. We're going from the 90s now into the 2000s, the early 2000s. We're going to be talking about a song from The Killers. And that song is Mr. Brightside. I I mean, this song, again, the music sounds pretty upbeat. I always kind of knew it was a, a bummer of a song. Um, but, Kev, do you know what Mr. Brightside is about? I don't. Do you know the song, Mr. Brightside? Uh, I probably heard it before, but I'm not You've too familiar it. with it. You've heard yeah. it probably a lot. <laughs> yeah. Probably. It's somehow become, yeah. 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 <laughs> it's become like their biggest song that everybody knows. They have some other great songs, I but this is the one that look, it's everyone knows. It's killing me. Yeah. Do you know where the killers got their name from, by the way? I, I feel no. like I do, but I can't remember. I feel like you've told me before. I'm pretty sure it's from a, a uh, Duran Duran video. I think you have told me that. It was before, on the yeah. drum head of their drummer. Like they, for whatever reason, put the Killers on their drum head. And, you know, the Killers are like, hey, that's a great band. That's interesting. Yeah. I want to talk about fact. this real briefly. We'll go off. And if I'm road. wrong, I'll I'll put the truth like right about there. If I'm wrong, you guys don't know it. So that's what it is now. Yeah. <laughs> you guys and i actually want to do an episode on this and i bring this up for a reason and no they are not that for me but do you guys well i'll start with that one they they are they were this for me do you guys ever have a band that like you've heard them and you really like their stuff but you just for whatever reason never really got into them not that's not fair to say you never really went the mile to try to get into them or listen to their stuff you really liked everything you heard but you just sort of left it at that you guys had, did you have bands like that? Cause the killers were like that for me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, Everything, until your wife went to go see them. And then until we went and saw the killers in yeah. concert. And that happens sometimes where it's like, Oh God, like uh, better than Ezra is coming to concert here again. And I actually always liked better than Ezra stuff. And I went and saw him a few years ago. And I'm like, Oh my God, they changed like my whole perspective when I saw him live and Brandon flowers, man from the killers is he's a, fantastic showman he sounds great on stage live and he puts on a hell of a show and i always liked the killer stuff but i never really got into it. like never just went that extra mile my wife is really into him and then i uh, she took we went to see him and i'm like oh my God, these guys are they're fucking great so i was very stoked that being said what i want to do an episode of a show on which we will is uh have there ever been bands where for lack of a better term you're just like meh <laughs> like it's they're fine i hear that song and everyone else loves it and i don't hate it but i also just don't care <laughs> like, yeah a lot so of a lot of bands yeah so this mm-hmm. got brought up yesterday and my wife got so mad at me because we were in the car and she's like you better not say that this is one of those this is one of those songs and i'm like it totally is seven nation army came on and i'm like i've always been kind of meh <laughs> like, yeah there's nothing <laughs> wrong with it it's fine that, there are far better songs by white stripes jack white okay, whatever but, band he's in than seven nation army seven nation army is all right it's just become a meme about the white stripes mm-hmm. i'm like yeah. man they're fine whatever <laughs> like it's the fine like, it's, i don't know what it is it's like this song in other words the song comes on i'm not going to turn it but i'm probably not ever seeking it out either 
it's just weird. She's like, you better not say that. I love that song. I'm like, it's fine that you love the song. It's not that I dislike it. I think that'd be a fun episode where songs that were like, everybody just, I get labeled this way a lot. Like where people tell me like <laughs> you, Oh, my wife is always like you. Oh, here he hates um, love shack. I'm like, I don't hate it. I'm just really he tired just of it. Prefers rock lobster. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually. <laughs> like I just, I'm just kind of tired of it. I still uh, think we band. need to do an entire episode where we just talk like Fred Schneider. <laughs> <laughs> what you talking about? Hey, Matt. Welcome to the show. Hi, it's a mixtape. Yeah. <laughs> podcast. When you're doing fair, podcast, fair, fair, you start with a microphone. Microphone. <laughs> <laughs> but, but no, you're talking about a band that, in my opinion, has such a huge catalog and all we ever hear is Love Shack. I'm like, yeah. okay, well, it's fine. What about my own it? private it was, Idaho? It was a, it was a, right. Right. Like they so have, you, a, <laughs> I'm just saying, well, we hear, we hear two songs now. We hear Love Shack and then we hear Rome. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I forgot about Rome actually. Rome if you want to. So yeah, I get it. A lot of people say I hate Love Shack and I don't, I'm just like, I, just kind of tired of hearing it it's kind of yeah. like journey like you know don't stop believing is not the only song they do it's not even their best song um but we're not talking about that we're talking about the killers and mr brightside from 2004 again on the surface the music very poppy you know kind of f- sounds fun i've seen a ton of people out there belting out this song and dancing to it you know kind of like it was up in my mind. you know they're, they're going I, I just made up words those weren't real <laughs> It was up in my mind, not a fucking lyric in the yeah, song. He was avoiding copyright. That's what he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> but the lyrics are a little more disturbing than that if you really listen. And I don't think this song hides it so much, but I just don't think people are paying attention. And there's actually some reasoning behind it for this song. Um, this song is actually about Brandon Flowers himself and a true story that happened to him, part of it, and about the jealousy, the complete jealousy he felt, and then later the paranoia he began to feel towards just relationships in general. After he went to sleep one night, he was in Vegas and he goes to bed and he's, he's like, I wake up. I just had a feeling that something wasn't right. And I get up, my girlfriend's gone and I go down to the bar and he, he catches her cheating on him with an, with another dude and like kissing and stuff like that. And I think what this song really does is it captures how our minds, if you've ever been cheated on, which, uh, most definitely have um <laughs> we've got matt raising a hand down there as well kevin have you ever been cheated on uh even in chess oh yeah chess definitely <laughs> no, just <laughs> fucking special it's like nah girls don't cheat like, on me. nah man he's I'm like all girls, about that whole life they know <laughs> they know better than to cheat on. the kc masterpiece <laughs> yeah <laughs> See, he spells it Master P E A C E, but sometimes it's the Master P I E C E. Yeah, <laughs> the masterpiece. It sounds uh, better than stuff. Master Peen, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Master Peen. Uh, well, here's the thing about being cheated on. One of the things it really does to you is it gets in your brain, and you don't have you you rarely have details, but your brain starts making details up your mind can't take the situation and it starts building it up and and creating these images and scenarios in your head that if you're not careful, will kind of drive you insane. You can't, it's like you don't even know what happened, but your brain starts telling you what happened. And the lyrics of the song really get that across. Well, I mean, he caught her in a bar kissing a dude, right? He didn't, there was nothing else for him, but that, the song okay so the lyrics are now i'm falling asleep and she's calling a cab while he's having a smoke and she's taking a drag now they're going to bed and my stomach feels sick and it's all in my head but she's touching his chest now he takes we all know what he wanted to say Mm -hmm. yeah now she's touching he's but she's touching his chest now he's he takes off her dress now let me go i just can't look it's killing me and taking control he didn't see any of that stuff he didn't see her going to bed with him he didn't see her ta- him taking off her dress and her touching his chest. Um, but like he said, I just I can't I just can't look. It's killing me and it's taking control. I, I can't get it out of my head that this is what happened. 
and this song does a really good job of capturing that paranoia of like, yeah, I can't, this is all I can see now. That's all I can think about. And I, when people like get cheated on, they stay together. It's very like, wow. Cause like, I know your brain is eating, eating at you all the time. And like how, and that's the, the, the sarcasm of the song is I'm Mr. Brightside. Like, oh, all this is going on in my head. Don't worry. I got it, though. I'm Mr. Brightside. I'll look at the bright side of things. But he really can't. He can't do it. That's the problem. This is a great song, great lyrics. Like, to me, this really captures that feeling. So, I don't know, Matt, was it like that for you? Like, when you got cheated on, did you, like, play scenarios in your head and, like, couldn't, it just ate at you and ate at you? He's like, no, nah. I was like, fuck you, No, bitch. no. <laughs> it was pretty clear what happened. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, it was, there was clear. no imagination. Oh, well. No, well, well, not much imagination. It was not clear what happened to uh, to me, um, but uh, yeah, <laughs> like I didn't want details. I wanted no details. I'm like, I don't want details. No, I just left when it happened. I was like, nope, I'm done. So that was smart. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do that. I I eventually did. You know what? I'm not going to talk about it, but I'm. It, it, it turned out to be there was a blessing in there, so we're going to leave it at that. Uh, there you go. But yeah, it does mess with you really bad, and. Even, but even then, dude, you got to admit somewhere down there, even if it shouldn't, even though part of you knows, like, no, this person's just horrible, just a horrible person. It had nothing to do with me. Part of you still feels pain. Like, my pride took a little hit. Like, or does it have something to do with me? Even if it didn't, it's hard not to think those thoughts. It's hard not to get caught up in shit. So, I love the lyrics of the song. I always have. Um, but this is another one of the songs that even though I was singing it, in my car or whatever, one day I started really listening to what I was saying. See, I think that's important. You will sing it and not listen to what you're singing. And yep. then one day you do. And you're like, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you got to pull over and go, what the hell have I been singing Matt, this whole time? That's literally <laughs> like driving down the street. He's like, oh, I got to pull the fuck over. Like, hey, yeah, is about what? Hang on. <laughs> hang on, <laughs> you see guys. You see Matt sitting at the oh. side of the road going, no. People what? stop. Do you, you need help? You got any car trouble? No, man. Yep. Some real deep lyrics just came I'm on the radio. To hey, you <laughs> like, oh, shit. <laughs> they give him a hug. It's mind blown. Yeah. The cops are called. Yeah. Like, um, Outcast really messed him up that day. <laughs> yeah. If somebody's going to do it, it's going to be Outcast, right? Like, mm -hmm. probably. Somebody call Miss Jackson. Yeah. yeah. Simon Jackson. Ooh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna go to the 80s now and i'm gonna say this next one's kind of a cheat we have two more songs to talk about this next one's a little bit of a cheat because it's not really a sad song it's just a very goofy sounding song that's actually about something a little more serious but it actually ends on a very happy note we're gonna be talking about the clash 1982 rock the casbah or um, lock the cash box for you folks who can't understand in the cat box. <laughs> 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 um, this song reached number eight on the Billboard Hot 100. It was like one of the only one of the Clash's only songs to like get that high, which is weird because uh, great band. You would think like, should I stay or should I go? Would have been a bigger hit. Now it that might in more recent days have turned yeah, around maybe. because it was maybe. on stranger things yeah i love you know, i love that song but like i like this one. song i love this band they're a great band um <laughs> r.i.p <Joe> just <sighs> so if you know you know or and if you don't know <laughs> I'm about to tell you the song sounds fun enough uh although he sings with sort of a slur and a little bit of an like his voice in the song is very like slurry like he's doing it on purpose and there's a little bit of an intentional accent on certain words in the song like, Sherry, if don't like it, dun, 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 dun. lock the cash box. box. Lock the cash <laughs> box. Rock the Casbah, folks. Um, so, do you guys know what the Casbah is? Before we move on, mm. this seems like a Kevin thing to know. Uh, I want to say, um, let's see. I want to say like a bar, right like in the Middle East, or no, it is in the Middle East, no. but it's not a bar. Uh, I, I was like, if Kevin just gets this right out of his ass, I'm going to be like, oh, God, I give up. Kevin's just like, I'm going to say it's probably this. And he would have been right. And I'd be like, oh, of course he got this. Right. <laughs> uh, the Casbah is a fortress in the Middle East. Um, it's just a fortress. Uh, it's there. Yeah. Uh, so the song itself a, is a, 
burger stand in Lawrence, Kansas, but sure. <laughs> the Casbah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Now they're into the Casbah, 805 Massachusetts, pieces. Lawrence, Kansas. Go check it out, maybe. <laughs> Go check it out, maybe. Is, is it good? Oh, I've driven by there actually. Oh, you've yeah, never been there. Four point six out of five stars. Oh, oh so you've never eaten there. I've never eaten there, but I'm going reviews. to next time I go to Lawrence. Yeah, you can check it out now. Yeah. So the song itself is actually about a king who bans rock and roll. So what do the people do? They hold a massive concert in this fortress, the Casbah. That's why we get rock the Casbah. The whole thing is telling a story throughout the whole song. This is a fictitious telling. It's not a real thing that happened. Anyway, they decide we're going to hold this massive rock concert because the king, you know, banned it. Well, the king gets pissed at him, and he calls out his jet fighters, and he says, fly over it and bomb all these people. Oh. And the jet fighters take off. I believe this pronounced they don't jet fighters. Here's what happens. The That's king called up his jet started. fighters. He said, you better earn your pay. Drop your bombs between the uh, minarets down the Casbah way. As soon as the sheriff was chauffeured out of there, the jet pilots turned to the cockpit radio blare. So what happens is the jet fighters take off. Mm. And then as soon as the, the he leaves, they're like, Look you, and they turn up the rock and roll music, and they rock out in their cockpits. Rock out with the cockpit. Rock out with your cockpit out. <laughs> <laughs> rock it out with your cockpit out. There you go. So this is actually based. It's a fictitious, fictitious song, but it's it is based on an actual ban uh, that was enforced in Iran since the Iranian Revolution that does in fact ban, ban Western music uh, in Iran. So far kind away. Of a, kind of a bummer thing. Hmm. But uh, do what did you just say? <laughs> no, no. Yeah, you I said you said I ran. So and I said far you said away. far away. I thought that's yeah. what you said, but I I wasn't sure. And I <laughs> um yeah, it so, couldn't get away. The end of the song. <laughs> shut up. <laughs> Aurora Borealis. Ah! <laughs> you did it, guys. The speech lessons have been helping. <laughs> um, so Rock the Casbah is not actually a sad song in the end. They they win. But it is sad to know that there's a, an entire freaking country that bans Western music just good to keep stuff away from people. Yeah. Well, there's a reason they do that though. These countries who ban stuff like that do it because they don't want people to see outside of the bubble they've put them in right manipulate people when you do that yep. which is weird because in north korea he loves american movies and basketball apparently dennis rodman mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and i think steven seagal maybe i don't know probably at least, yeah at least that's what steven seagal tells us the way he yeah. runs <laughs> any fight kevin do your do your steven seagal run uh. Everybody's <laughs> not watching video. I'm not sure what he just did. He just looks like uh, it's like a run slash waddle. You yes. look like like a heavy set dude who he just is fed up with running, so he's like hit the end of his run try. He's just like, oh, yeah. forget it. You look like when I'm running, basically, is what he's saying. <laughs> yeah. I I want to see you run now. All right, we got we got one more song on this list. Um this is a song that is really depressing. I caught on pretty quick that it was really depressing. Um, mm -hmm. I like the song a lot, but this song is, and it was meant to be, just so we clear about that. This one comes from 2010. This is a little band that I wrote their name wrong on my notes and says Foister the People, but the band <laughs> is actually called Foster the People, and the song is Pumped Up Kicks. So this is pumped up kicks by Foster the People or or Foister the Peeper People Peeper. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have it. I'll insert it here because um, yeah. a little bit of a stroke there. Yeah. What she yeah. said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did Matt not have it either? Oh, you got you guys yeah, in the background. So Foister there the Peoples, uh, pumped up kicks. So this one came out in 2010, like I said. Uh, this is a chipper sort of feeling song. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I want to say this and see if you, get, if you agree with me on this song. While it does sort of have some kind of 
funky music and kind of get your head moving. Mm. Did it also kind of, did it always have a little bit of a creepy vibe to it too? Mm. Yeah. There's something eerie about the song, even though you might not have been going through the the voice changer thing. Yeah. What what does the singer from Foster the People actually sound like? Because this is the song everybody knows and he's got a, he's got a vocal effect going on it. Hmm. I don't know. Cause they didn't really, they haven't really had another, they didn't really do anything else that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, so Kevin, do you know what the song is about? Uh, isn't about school shootings kind of. Yeah. Uh, for lack of a better, yes, essentially the the whole thing is told unnecessary violence, basically the Mm -hmm. eyes of, of one guy, um, who's telling the, the story. So, uh, written from the viewpoint of a guy who's suffering from mental instability and is having thoughts about shooting kids. Mark Foster from the band said, I wrote Pumped Up Kicks when I began to read about the growing trend of teenage mental illness. I wanted to understand the psychology behind it because it was foreign to me. It was terrifying how mental illness among youth had skyrocketed in the last decade. I was scared to see where the pattern was heading if we didn't start changing the way we were bringing up the next generation. Um, So he's saying in the song that the, the, the narrator is jealous He's jealous of his classmates. He's jealous of the things that he sees them wearing and the the things they have. And he basically says, um, you better be able to outrun my gun because I'm going to shoot you and I'm going to take your stuff or your pew pew. As it is. <laughs> they're going to be careful gonna now. And he's going to take this stuff. Do what? I was like, careful now. We got to. Well, that's what the song's about. I can't, I can't <laughs> yeah. help that, you know, but no. Yeah. The pumped up kicks do refer to something from the nineties. Yeah. They that's what I was thinking. Do. The pumps. So in the nineties we had Nike the Reebok pump. pump. Yeah, Reebok. Reebok. Yeah. And they I don't know why, but they had a little it made you run faster, emblem. jump higher. You'd reach down and pump it and it would put mm-hmm. air somewhere in your shoe. I don't know. It was a weird trend. Uh but that he is referring to that and he's saying, like, basically, you better be are, are those shoes gonna help you run fast enough to get away from me? You know. Because I'm, uh, it's it's really disturbing. Um, yeah, creepy AF. Yeah. As for the music being upbeat, uh, it's got a Foster, great beat. Foster yeah, actually can dance to it. it. You're mm-hmm. gonna like this. You're gonna like why the music is the way it is. This is kind of fun. He said it's a fuck you song to hipsters in a way, but it's a song the hipsters are gonna want to dance to. And they did. <laughs> like, it was intended they how they danced. It mm-hmm. was intentional that it was that a beat because he wanted the message to get across to certain people. Like, I want you to hear this because there is a problem in this country and maybe you'll catch it. Maybe you'll listen to the lyrics and you'll be like, oh, that's interesting. Uh, so Jeffrey Berg of Frontier Psychiatrist um, actually came out and said some stuff about this, too. And he said, I was so engrossed with the cheery melody of its chorus that it took me a few listens to to discover that the lyrics suggest tar- dark Columbine revenge. And that's what we were talking about. This song comes off as like, kind of like, doom, 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 doom. and you're like, yeah, mm-hmm. I feel it. I feel it. I feel it. And then you start listening and you're like, wait, what did he just say? <laughs> he said, you better outrun my bullet. <laughs> and he did. That's, that's what he says. Um, the lyrics say he found a six shooter gun in his dad's closet. And with a box of fun things, I don't even know what, but he's coming for you. Yeah, he's coming for you. All the other kids with the pumped up kicks, you better run, better run, outrun my gun. All the other kids with the pumped up kicks, you better run, better run faster than my bullet. That is a depressing ass song. So, yeah, it is 100% about (laughs) what you thought it was about. Um, I think it's interesting. And it's weird because this is 2010 and now we are in 2024 and we talk about this a lot on the show, how we'll we'll discuss a certain song and say like, why is it becoming more relevant instead of less? Like, when is this going to stop? You know, when Mm. this particular one deals with um, like young kids with mental illness that, you know, shoot up schools and stuff. And it's frightening to think I actually I lived in Littleton, Colorado, and Columbine was the next Columbine High School was the next town over. And my sister, when she was in high school, used to compete with Columbine, like the, the you know, like sporting events and stuff. And I actually had a cousin that worked at Columbine and uh she had actually left the year before. 
Wow. She wasn't, luckily she wasn't there yeah. when it all went down. Yeah. But I remember when, like, I heard about that because Columbine was such a, like, poof, like blew my mind. And then we started hearing more and more stuff. And it, I guess it just sort of struck him. And he was like, I want to write a song that kind of deals with it. So yeah. it's a great song, by the way. Yeah, it is. You know, I was actually you... in high school when Columbine happened still. I graduated in 99 when Columbine actually happened. And um, I don't know if it was the same across the country, but our school went into lockdown because that was like the first big school shooting that happened and mm. unfortunately was not the last. So, but yeah, it, it affected a lot of people and I could totally understand why they would want to write a song that, you know, feel kind of helpless a little bit well, and I'm, want to do something. I'm betting, uh, you know, their age too that this was probably something that we're older yeah um but this was probably a lot like his generation probably affects them a lot more and they mm -hmm. have to think about these things a lot more i mean i think about this a lot because we have dealt with in our generation our lifespan we have dealt with a few like really major um like events that, world like, events yeah mm -hmm. so like for we okay so for my grandparents it was pearl harbor right and i think about that for my mom and nothing growing up um because she uh, like uh, kennedy pearl assassination mom, yeah. yeah but she was young um i think the one that really hit us of course first was the challenger and yeah i think okay so my mom experienced the challenger and i don't know if people understand today this is a good thing, by the way, what I'm about to tell you is you do not understand the way these things impact you. I remember growing up hearing about Pearl Harbor, and then I started telling people when I had kids, they're going to hear about the World Trade Center, and it's going to hit, like, to them, it's going to be like when I heard about Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. I know that We're it like, happened. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's messed up, man. That sucks. But then when you live through it, yeah. it's a totally different thing altogether. So what I'm saying is I really don't want this generation to experience anything like that. It doesn't mean you won't. Yeah. Right. But I hope you don't. Um, I feel like I for them, though, it's more of just like a continuous. Yes. Like mm -hmm. nonstop. Absolutely. You know. But I'm talking about those big events that yeah. like, like just rock your. We, we were watching um, the TV show Mixed Dish. My wife, I watched it when it was on. My wife's been watching it and they actually have an episode where the challenger explodes and she's talking about it <laughs> like how it affected her and i was telling my wife i'm like what they're doing in the show these kids are all in a classroom and they wheel in the tv that happened we were yep they wheeled in a tv and we watched it as kids you know watch this happen and not almost had big to... bird on the on the <laughs> space shuttle too well i remember not even trying to make a joke i mean that that yeah, was no, no, a real were, thing they almost, yeah. they almost sent big bird up in with it as well I remember being a kid and not knowing how to process it. And like, I don't, I know what just happened, but I don't fully understand what just happened, which is that episode is all about that, by the way. And I'm kind of getting back to the point here is <laughs> for his generation, for their generation, these are things that they have experienced from the time they were young and it just keeps happening. And he's like, what's that do to your mind? We're getting real deep and philosophical here, really but what are. does it do? And how do you express how do you process that and express that? I think that's what the song probably is about for him is how do I process these things that I keep saying and hearing about like Columbine, like Sandy Hook. How do I, how do I process that? So it's messed up. It's a great song, but this is one of the songs where earlier we were like, some of these get a little depressing and I'm like, now it's hard for me to listen to them. Yeah. This one knowing, like I still love the song, but knowing like what, what the, yeah. might, it's, it's kind of like, I can't just hear it now. I have to have all deep thoughts and shit. <laughs> <laughs> so there's some of the songs we brought up. There are more, obviously. There were some that I thought about talking about, Electric Avenue, but we've talked about Electric Avenue on the show before. Yeah, I think like at least twice. Very upbeat, not a mm -hmm. happy story. It's about riots yep. that happened. Um, there's a few more that uh, considered you know yeah like basket case by green day not really a happy song underneath sounds like it if you're listening to it but it's not but not the same kind of unhappy yeah. it's just about a kind of pathetic loser yeah we uh, could almost if, make this a multi-part series but there's yeah, so could. many songs that could have been talked about on this we could uh what do you what are your guys thoughts about the ones we talked about and are, are there any like are there any of these that really hit you that you remember just like god that one knocked me for a loop 
I uh, didn't oh. know about Crocodile Rock. That took me by surprise. Really? I mean, it's yeah. right there in the lyrics, man. Just like, yeah. <laughs> for me, it was Detroit yeah. Rock City. Like, I never yeah. knew that. I, I'd never known that myself either. But uh, for me, probably the impression that I get, that one, I, I I just thought it was, you know, a song about, you know, struggles in life and, you know, being fortunate that you hadn't been tested. Uh, but now it it's it's kind of it could be could be that but yeah. yeah I'm gonna have to go back and give it another re-listen, <laughs> which is another excuse for me to listen to the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones. There you go. There, there you go. So. so are there any songs you guys feel like wow they should have been on this list? Like we can do another part, but any songs you're like mm. that we should have talked about that. Mm. I want to mm. I want to hear. If there's any songs that you like? It sounds like it's I was always a happy song. What kind of brought this up was we're going to be doing an episode. Ooh, I got I got a great one actually that that should be talked about on there and uh, we're yeah. going to keep it for one second because okay. what we're going to be doing what brought I want to I want to get to this what brought it up because that'll trigger what brought this up was I reached out to the guys and said what are songs like yeah, I want a couple songs from you guys that just make you happy that you listen to them and they make you happy and Jaden and one of you like guys are. <laughs> one of you guys, Matt, sent a song <laughs> over, and I'm like, "That makes that, that makes you happy." What, what what was the song, Matt? It, it was obviously "Stay" by Lisa Loeb. <laughs> <laughs> I said, "That's a very sad song, Matt." <laughs> and he goes, "Well, yeah." And I guess, and I was like, "I guess I should have rephrased it different." Like, what are songs? I just that enjoy the song. Will so, make you like will cheer people up if they're in kind of a bummer mood is what I yeah. guess I should have said. I want to make like a sounds corny, but I want to do a happy playlist. These are songs that make us happy and, and cheers up. And then I was like, and then I wanted like I started thinking, I'm like, we should do like the complete opposite of that. But like there is no opposite. <laughs> like, what are songs that just make me fucking cry? Like, I don't know that they well, there might be <laughs> like there's a few. Heart light. Turn on your heart light in the middle of me. He leaves. Yeah, soul glow. ET leaves. <laughs> um, no. Soul but what that glow. made me think of was like, okay, but what are songs that we thought were happy songs? And then I kind of put it out to you guys. So what, Matt, what song are you thinking of that? Uh, okay, so you want me to tell you the title, but do you also want me to tell you why? Yeah, or, absolutely. Okay. So uh, I would say, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the band Say Anything. Yes, they are named after the John Cusack movie. Uh, but they have a song called Alive with the Glory of Love. And it is one of the most upbeat, happy, catchy, you know, make you make you booty move kind of, you know, songs. Make uh, but it's about the Holocaust. Oh. Oh. Yeah. 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 It is. And it took me several listens to catch that. And I don't know why, because it is pretty blatant at points. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a very, very dark song, but it does not sound like it in the slightest bit. So that, that'd be one of my, my picks as a, we'll call it an honorable mention for this what episode. Was, what's the name of the song? Alive with the glory of love. Alive with the glory of love. Yeah. Hmm. And if you have the ability to play a little bit of the audio, um, go for it just so you can hear how catchy it is i don't know if i do or not um but i was i was gonna at least give so this song came out in 2004 off the album is a real boy I, i'd never heard this before <clears throat> but that's yeah wow so this song you said it's a really <laughs> upbeat song very upbeat uh, song uh here let's see if this will play let's see if we can right. play part and of yes that. it's about the holocaust oh, that's yeah. interesting that's interesting yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh well, way to bring it down, Matt. <laughs> did you read? The, did you read some of the lyrics? I did not. Um, Go ahead I talk and read about, some of the lyrics. I talk right. about uh, school shootings, and Matt talks about the, like, this was such a. Happy it's a. It's a very catchy song. It's probably one of their most well known songs. That, but to be fair, that to be fair, to be fair, to be fair, um, that band they're kind of known for writing extremely dark, depressing songs that just sound really wow. happy. The chorus yeah. says, no, I won't let them take you. Won't let them take you. Hell no, no. I won't let them take you. <laughs> they literally talk and, about, we got to be quiet so they don't find us in hiding. And when our city, Jeez. vast and shitty, falls to the axis, 
they'll search the buildings, collect gold fillings, watch wallets, wallets and, and rings. rings. But but Miss Black Eyeliner, you'd look finer with each day in hiding. Beneath the wormwood, ooh, love you so good. They won't hear us screw away the day, I'll make you say. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's a good one, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not, but it is. <laughs> now, if you listen, like I said, if you listen to the entire song, it's very catchy. It's very upbeat. It's very and, ska punk sounding. Yeah. You know. It would be in the the like emo kind of genre type of thing. It's kind of it had I real big on. uh, I don't know the band well. Had a little bit of a rockabilly thing sound to it from the clip. That song a little bit. Mm. Yeah, Um, I don't know the band. Trying to remember. God, they have another song that's just about being just super loser, and yeah, he like calls a sex line, and that's just how he spends his night. I mean, that sounds like a Green Day song. <laughs> yeah, it's a basket case. Uh, yeah, right. Mm-hmm. So there you go, guys. There's yeah. a. There you go. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! Bringing it down. Uh, we did mention, guys, that we are on YouTube. So if you're not, go over and check them those out. Not just these videos. We. One <laughs> that of was the, the quietest slide whistle ever. One. Of, one uh, of the, I didn't even know. <laughs> yeah. I just I just happened to look at him when he did it. One so. of the things is. Um, <laughs> he just let all the air out of Kevin's slide whistle. <laughs> so one of the things that we're doing over on our TikTok and our YouTube now isn't just these videos, but we're doing other videos as well. Of course, uh, when we do our Twisted Kid stuff, that's over there. You can actually sit and watch us do our commentary. Or uh, you can go over, because I'm doing movie news updates, so um, talking about like Before the Crow trailer came out we talked about our thoughts on the reboot and then when the crow trailer came out we dropped a thing talking about that we give some news about the upcoming mario brothers sequel we t- just stuff like that so that's our tiktok and our youtube those are up there so go check those out if nothing else and those are s- shorter you know 10 minutes or less usually closer to five minutes but they're there so you can go check those out too tiktok youtube on those of course instagram is out there and so is twitter we are on both of those uh, I highly recommend those. We just did an interview. I like to shout these out because sometimes I'm like, I want you guys to know who this person is. We did an interview with Isaac Marion, uh, probably going up right after this, you know, shortly, or actually maybe even right before this. I don't know. I don't know where the timing goes. Isaac wrote the book warm bodies that the movie is based off of. And he wrote other books as well. I did not know originally that uh, Warm Bodies is a trilogy. There are two additional books, actually three technically, because there's a prequel novella that was written as well. But that's not the most interesting thing. We want you to listen to it. He is on YouTube. He does a series of videos, and he's on TikTok where he does a series of videos. Um, He went off the grid. Yeah, He lives mostly off the grid from society a bit yes and he talks about why and what that's been like for him and how that's affected his writing and great dude it was very for anybody who's a creator out there whether it be music or uh, art or you're a novelist you want to write any of that i think this is an important one to listen to we've only had a couple authors on this show uh john mayberry and john was great as well Mm -hmm. for some reason they are very inspirational interviews so i, I want to recommend that here's the thing we have video of that over there so you can go do that he's very active on instagram as well so we want to push you to things like our social media so you can find out about these guys that's kind of why we do it yeah. uh, and he has fun- a cat you can check out he's pretty he awesome does, cat. Does it, bob <laughs> bob made an appearance during the interview a couple of times and it was we were getting some laughs because he was uh making himself very well known um, uh, on top of that, we, uh, have our Facebook page and that's really the one where a lot of people interact and it's, it's starting to pick up a little bit. I know Facebook, right? But, uh, tapeworms fans of the mixtape podcast over there. Uh, it'll all be scrolling across the screen right here. One of the things we do over there is we post a lot of upcoming concerts, tours, uh, events like toy shows or cons. And not just in our area. We will post anyone we see. So 
you can go over there and find a lot of that stuff and interact with a lot of the fans. We have a good time over there. So go check that out as well. We haven't talked about this stuff in a while, so I wanted to give a shout out really quick. So yeah, go check all that stuff out. Um, I don't really have a lot else to add to this guys. Is there anything you want to, I, I asked this and never is. But yeah. I, always, I already added, you know, sure say is, anything alive with the glory of love. So it sure is. Like yeah. Kind of brought things down a little bit there. Sure. As I don't ask you guys, like, I wanted to talk about it. And then they're going to cry a lot. Yeah. Guys, you don't know what I put up with. Anybody that. watch Royal rumble from like 30 years ago? Anybody? <laughs> no. Okay. okay, real, real quick. Seriously, let's make this a two, three minute thing. I just got to ask you guys. <laughs> no, serious. You said that. It's your fault. This is, we're going to take this back to the 80s really quick, but not All really. Right. Jake Paul, Mike Tyson. Thoughts. Oh, he's going to get yeah. fucking destroyed. I fucking hope so. <laughs> yeah. I, have you heard, the, have you or seen the quote that it's come out since? No. Like, I think this was like yesterday. He said, I'm going to put this to an end. Like he's, Tyson he's. Is? Yeah, he said, yeah, I'm cool. going to put this to an end. He goes, I like him as a person, but these guys trying to challenge us old guys and then saying that we're Here's old, you're about Here's to learn. Mistake. Yeah, You don't piss off Mike Tyson. Yeah, he yeah. seems like He's really already nice bitten dude dudes ear off twice. Mad. And all I can say is I've watched both of their training. Like, by all accounts, whether you are a fan of the Logan guys or not, I know a lot of people hate them. He's For actually a really decent mm-hmm. boxer. Like, he's actually pretty good. His record is showing that he's good. I've watched is his training like videos. Good? And normally, I'm like, that's pretty good. But when they put the two side by side, 57-year-old Mike Tyson is destroying in training. Yeah. And he's hitting so fast and so hard at 57. Mm-hmm. And then they go over to Jake Paul, and I'm like, he's hitting hard and fast, but not even half. Nope. Like, he gets clocked. He's with no Tyson. Days. Yeah, so he might they put die. Some rules on it. They put some rules on it, right? He's allowed to wear headgear. Tyson's not, and he's allowed to uh, tag in his brother. Tag team boxing now? Okay, cool. I don't know how that. What's means. he gonna do? Like, just walk into a forest and film some shit he shouldn't be filming? Like, okay, round, good job. If he uh, like, he can swap out in round two. Uh, Logan will get destroyed if he climbs in the ring with Mike. Though, here's what I want to happen, and I hope that happens. Jake Paul gets in the ring. They ring the bell. He walks up, poof, one hit down. <laughs> That's what I want to see. We know. I'm Tyson. telling you that it can happen. That quote. Yep. I mean, he Mike Tyson is out for blood. He he is trying, according to him, he's trying to get people to stop challenging guys they should not challenge. Stop doing it. It's mm-hmm. dumb. Yeah, it's an exhibition fight, but it's going to make money. It's going to make a lot, and that's why. Yeah, I'm going to watch why, it. Why Jake <laughs> like, Paul does it? It, it probably won't. I actually last might watch long, it too watch because it. it's a Tyson fight. Honestly, yeah. boxing, I don't, I used to love to watch boxing, not so much anymore, but it's Tyson and there's something a little different about that, right? Yeah. I, I will say this though. I think everybody on screen right now mm. is smart enough to never challenge Mike Tyson. I think I can beat like, Mike for Tyson. any reason. <laughs> I see you what don't... you did. No, that was just me in disgust. <laughs> All right. So that's it. We went on a little Mike Tyson rant, but we're going to end this episode. Guys, we always love having you here. Uh, please be part of the discussion. Let us know what your thoughts are on the Tyson fight and let us know what your thoughts are on the songs we picked this week. And if there's any you would add to the list, uh, I think that's all I got. We love you guys. Please come back next time when we will talk about something else. <laughs> Until then, maybe nothing. We don't always talk about shit. Uh, you know what we should do one time? We should have a non-episode. The googly eyes. Where we just the what free we thought. Pre, yeah. What we do pre-roll. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of talk about explosive diarrhea when we do that. But mm-hmm. We didn't need to bring that up, but okay. Yeah. Matt and I once had a whole conversation about the time we should our pants. <laughs> A real thing. Yep, that happened. So, how, and the uh, conversation like, ended with Jay going, "We should talk about this on the show." Like, We're good. The show. We Let us know to. out there if you would like us to do a non-show, which is just us for an hour of rolling and just talking <laughs> about whatever bullshit with how we normally talk to one another. We will do that if you want. It'll be our show about nothing. It yeah. will be our show about. We'll call nothing. it the Seinfeld episode. <laughs> that would be misleading. <laughs> True. <laughs> you yeah. were like, they didn't talk about Seinfeld at all. <laughs> We'll just come on like Seinfeld, What's right? The deal yeah. with Oval? It's just us doing our impression oh, of airplane food. 
Oh. What's the deal with Ovaltine? It's not even oval. Stu comes in like Kramer. And it's not in its teens. Oh. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> Newman. <laughs> Stewman. <laughs> yeah, we need to call Spanky in for that one. He can come flying in like like Kramer. Like, oh, God. <laughs> All right. That's it. We love you guys. Until next, we have the opportunity to speak. Remember to always stay, stay awesome. awesome. Thank you for watching the mixtape. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Click the bell icon for notifications when new videos come out. And remember to always stay awesome.